Hello and welcome to what is the first project build on the channel. Today we're going to be having a look at this little candle holder project. It's a little tea-like candle holder project with a nice little tidy little housing joint in it. Um, so stick around and I'll show you how to mark it out and I'll show you how to make it. Okay, so first thing we're going to do, and I just did it off camera there, is I'm going to draw this little symbol, it's called a face side and face edge mark. Alright, so a little squiggle like this and two legs down the side. I'm going to face that towards me, okay? I'm going to do that because I want to make sure my troy square goes in against the what we call the legs, of the face, which is the face edge mark of this, okay? Um, let's push it in. With our thumb, make sure it's in tight against that edge and index finger on the blade. Alright, that allows us to slide it across like this while keeping it in tight against the edge of our timber. Alright, in my other hand then, I'm going to take my steel ruler and I'm going to use that to push my troy square along like this. They work together, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure 40 millimeters, okay? So that there's 40 millimeters between the edge and the edge of the troy square, like so. All right, so there's my 40 millimeters there like that. And I'm just gonna draw a line across. All right, it's important that we make sure that this troy square is tucked in tightly against the edge of the timber. We want that line to be at a right angle to the edge. Okay, 90 degrees to the edge, we want it to be straight across. All right, now that we've got that done, we're gonna mark what's called the width of our trench here, okay? However, to be sure that we've got the right measurement for this, we need to flip our piece on its edge and measure the thickness. All right, the thickness of this is 18 millimeters, okay? All right, because that's, we're gonna cut a small bit off this and we're gonna slot it into the trench we cut out, all right? So I need to measure 18 millimeters between this line and the next line I draw. So let's do that now, Troy square in. Let's use our Troy square and our steel ruler together and let's make sure that there's 18 millimeters between this line and the edge of the troy square, okay? So there's 18 there exactly. Triple check our measurements always. Because you can always adjust your markings out before you start cutting, but once you start cutting, you can't fix any mistakes really. All right, so there we go. That line's going across like that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come across and leave 45 millimeters to my next line, okay? So let's measure across 45 millimeters. I'm gonna correct that because that's not gonna be enough. Let's measure across another 70 millimeters. There we go, that's better. All right, 70 millimeters. And let's draw that line across. So just to go back over that again, we've gone from 40 from the edge to the force line, 18, 18 millimeters over for the width of the trench, and then I'm gonna have to go on 70 millimeters over to the end line on this, okay? Now, that's what it looks like there when you look at it from where I'm sitting, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip it up on its edge. Now, you're not gonna be able to see the markings out on this, okay? Just because I'm gonna have the, the camera at this angle. If I move the camera, my hands are gonna get in the way. So this is what we're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to just trust me on this one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my Troy square and now I'm going to flip this piece up on its edge and put my troy square in and mark those lines across this edge. Okay, so my troy square touches the side that has the markings out and I'm just going to square, as in draw those lines, those three lines around the edge. Okay, so it looks something like this. Troy square in. I've lined it up now with the, the force line I drew and I'm just going to draw this across the top. And I'm going to slide it over do it on the second line, slide it over, do it on the third line. And that's what it looks like there. All right, you're gonna be able to see this second part a lot better, all right? The second part then, I flip it up so that the lines face away from me, all right? I take my troy square and I flip my troy square over so that it's facing towards me, put my thumb on the timber, and this time my three fingers push it in from the back. And now what I do, is I slide that over 
like so, so that it's in line with the line. And then I mark that all the way around like this. One, two, and then there's the third one. Now, the only thing I need to do is I need to mark my depth here so that I know how far down on this trench I need to cut. I'm going to do that with a marking gauge, okay? Now this tool, often in, in the early stages of woodwork, can be a bit difficult to use. However, it is one of the most important tools, and if you can get comfortable with it, bear with it, stay resilient, it's going to be the tool that's going to help you take your accuracy to, it, to another level. Okay, it is much more accurate to mark something, inscribe something with a, a marking gauge than it would be with a pencil, okay? So, if I, Loosen off the thumb screw here, the yellow thumb screw. The stock and the stem are loose. Okay, what I want to do is I want to measure 10 millimeters, which would be half the thickness of my material between the stock and the pin. And I do that by taking my steel ruler, resting my steel ruler on my um, on my stock, and measuring until the pin. Now, I don't know if you can see it on that shot there, but I'll try to get it on the, the, the one I have to me, beside me voice here to my left. Um, you can see that I put the pin in line with the number 10, and then I held it, and I held the stock with my thumb. If I just put a little bit of pressure with my thumb on the stock, it pushes the stock and stem together and holds it in place. So there's the uh, 10 millimeter mark, where the, between the, the pin and the stock it is important to make sure that you're working from the edge of the pin not the back of the pin you don't want your steel ruler right in against the back of the pin because the back of the pin has its own thickness you want to work right to the edge of the pin like that hold it in place tighten it back up okay and one of the most important things then is to double check it because most of the time the stock will slip and you could be a mill or two off and no we're bang on Okay, so I'm going to open the voice up and I'm going to kind of put my face in it at a bit of an angle like this, all right? Now, I'm going to hold my um, marking gauge, my thumb on the bottom corner, so there's the pin, the pin's down there, okay, my thumb on the corner, my index finger on the opposite corner, I'm going to put two fingers on the stem and one baby finger behind the stem. That baby finger is very important because it keeps things steady, gives you a lot of your, your strength to push the, the marking gauge on. Now, this is where our kind of face mark, face, face side, face edge marks come in handy. Let's put the stock in against the edge of this, make sure it's right in against the edge. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the last of my two lines. So I'm only concerned about these two lines, this 20 millimeters here. I'm gonna go to the last one and I'm gonna put a pinhole in it. I'm gonna put a little pinhole in it, okay? and making sure that my stock stays in tight against my piece of timber so there's no gaps there okay and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to the other end of the line so right down to the other end of the line and i'm going to scribe a mark pushing it away from me at all times between my two lines but while making sure my stock stays in against my piece of timber here now the reason it's important that I have the little pinhole is it acts as a brake and stops the marking gauge from scribing all the way down my piece. I'm going to move you again for the second one so you can see it from the other side. Okay, so just for the second part then, I'm going to open my voice. I'm going to keep it in the voice. I'm just going to slide it over like this, kind of flip it end for end essentially. Okay, so here's my two marks. I'm going to take my marking gauge again. I'm going to hold it the same way. I'm going to put my thumb on the bottom corner, index finger in the top, two fingers on the stem, one finger behind it looks something like this put it in so that the stock is against the timber and just on the back line little pinhole and then come to the nearest line and just lightly push it away from you now you can use your other hand just to kind of give it momentum but just be careful you're not pushing out so you're not pushing the, the marking edge away from your piece by doing this and now that should be yourself sorted that should be your um your whole marking out process done essentially for this part of the project so i've marked out the trench for the housing joint okay so we've used the marking gauge we have that marked out we have a a, a rudder 80 mil line marked out and um, i sincerely hope i got good angles on that 
shot and we were able to see properly and my hands weren't getting in the way. Um, and what I'm doing here now is I'm just marking X's, which is called waist marks. Um, just across the, the top of this piece between those two lines and then on the side and then on the side. I'm going to put a pencil mark then along my marking gauge line. Just a pencil mark along my marking gauge line. Um, I have to say, this is kind of one of the first demonstrations that I'm recording for this YouTube channel and I'm getting um, very conscious of the, the camera angles as I'm working, um, which is, is kind of amusing. It's a lot different than teaching a, uh, a live class. Right, so, so far we have that marked out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and get my tools and then I'll come back to you. So what you need to do then is open up your voice here, take your bench hook, put your bench hook into it, and then tighten it back up to make sure it's secure, so the bench hook's not going to move on me. If you're right-handed, you want to have this little notch on the right-hand side where the gap is. If you were left-handed, just flip this over and the notch will be on the left-hand side for you. Now you're going to see that I've already got the kerf already cut in it, because it's the second time I had to do this video. Unfortunately, you're going to be interrupted uh, as I'm recording these, and uh, I'm just going to have to do my best to kind of make the videos have some sort of continuity and stuff like that. Um, it is the context of doing it within my school and, and within my job. So um, I'll show you how to do this and start this anyway. Push the piece in against the uh, voice like so. I'm going to line it up so that the line that's on the right hand side is in line with the edge of the notch. That's going to help us keep it straight. How do we use a tenon saw? Well, we hold it straight up like this. We keep our index finger to the outside. We never tilt it left and right. And we don't turn it at angles like this. There's no need for it right now. We're going straight across. Keep the saw straight up, okay? Let's hold my piece in. Keep my thumb away from the, the line because I don't want to cut that. And let's lean over and put our saw resting on the back of our timber. And let's pull it back towards us three times. So I've already done that. Pulled it back three times there. And that's where you see the notch that's already in it. So, but if I was to do it again, it's just like that. That's all we need to do. Pull it back. Okay, and what that does is it gives us that little kerf that you would have seen just as the start of the video because obviously, as I said, it's the second time I'm recording it. All right, so let's line it back up. And we're just going to cut through this. I'm going to show you how to cut this. We're not going to go all the way down. We're going to go down as far as that line. It's very important that we don't go below it. Okay, so let's go down as far as the marking gauge line. All right, so I have my, and you can see I use my index finger on my other hand, up here, not down here where it can get cut, but up here just to guide the, the saw, okay? All right, so using the full length of the saw, all right? Staying on my line. And as I get close to the line, and I've been watching it on the back here, I'm going to kind of lean over and just check see how I'm getting on here. And I haven't gone down as far as I need to here, so let's keep going. There we go. Down to the line then like so. And perfectly straight down. You can see there, I haven't gone past my line, okay? So now I'm going to move this over and I'm going to cut and do the second line, okay, the, the other side of the trench. Now folks, because I'm recording this, a lot of the stuff's not gonna be, you know, 100% perfect. I wouldn't be overly happy with that cut, now I have to say myself. Um, it's something I've realized doing these demonstrations on camera. Um, it's not like doing it live, but sure look, carry on anyway. The method is always accurate, all right? It's always what we want, it's what matters. So let's start this cut again, this second one. All right, same thing, rest the saw at an angle. Use my index finger to, to hold the, um, kind of guide the saw, to keep it straight. Then I'll pull it back towards me three times. Once, two, three. All right, now we've got a little kerf as before. It's better if you don't move it. I'm moving it for the purposes of showing you on camera, but it's better if you, after you get the toward, kind of after you do your cut, you just leave it there. You don't move your, your piece until you finish the cut. It'll make it more accurate. Let's go and let's finish this. Let's use the full length of the saw on this one, okay? Okay, and we just need to go down a little bit more. And you can see I keep checking it just to be sure. 
You don't want to go down below the line, the marking edge line. It just doesn't look nice. Okay, so I'm down there to the line on both sides of my trench, I'm front and back. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one cut in the middle of it to just break up this piece of waste, make it easier to remove. All right, so I'm just pushing this over to the middle of it roughly. It doesn't have to be perfect. And I'm just going to cut this off. I have no line to guide me. I'm just going to cut as straight as I can. And there, that's just going to help us break up the waste. Now, I'm going to just grab my chisel and my mallet, and I'll be right back to you. Right, so once again, just moved you into a different angle, give you an idea of what I'm looking at here, um, so you can see how we're doing things, and then I'll probably show you a wider angle after this, so you can see kind of what way I'm using the chisel and mallet together. Let's take our chisel in one hand, okay? One of the things that is really important that I kind of see woodworkers doing on YouTube that kind of frustrates me a little bit is there's no need for your hand to ever be in front of the chisel. You know, you see woodworkers doing some kind of techniques where they're holding their piece and they're chiseling with one hand like this and stuff like that. It's just so risky. There's no reason why you should do that when you have a voice or a clamp to clamp it to your piece to the bench. Because if that chisel was to slip, it's going into your hand. If I was to hold this in my hand and try and chisel or try and pair, it's just, it's totally unnecessary. So health and safety 101 and rule 101 that I tell my students, at no point should your hand be in front of the cutting edge of the chisel, okay? Keep your two hands behind it. In this case, it's very easy because you've got one hand on the chisel like this, and you've got your other hand on the mallet, and it's going to hit the back of the mallet like that. So it's not hard. But later on, I'm going to show you when we're flattening out this trench, I'm going to show you how to keep your hands, both, both hands behind the chisel. And they're the only two ways you really need to use your chisel. Okay? So let's start like this. Let's put our chisel resting on the edge of your voice. You don't need to try and take all of the waste at one time. Let's just take the top corner of it. And let's just give it a, small, a light tap at the mallet. And I want you to chisel upwards. Okay? That's the way we're going to chisel. We're going to chisel upwards. All right? And you can see I've just done two or three passes there, going down a few millimeters below each time. And I'm going to go down and we'll do one more maybe, and chisel upwards again. That was very easy to remove. Now, you can see here, I've just removed half the waste and I'm not going through to the back. Okay, so I don't need to go all the way through to the back of this. I'm going to flip my piece around and do the exact same thing from this side. Okay, chisel upwards. The reason I don't go all the way through from one side to the other is if I did, I would burst the back of it out. It would start splintering and chipping out. Okay, that's what we've got there. Now, I'm gonna put this flat in the voice again. I'm gonna move the camera angle again for you, just to show you. And I'm gonna show you how to do the pairing technique that's needed to flatten this out. Right, so now that I've moved you so you can see it from the front, I'm gonna show you how to do what's called the pairing technique. I've got my piece flattened again, making sure that my marking gauge lines are in line with the voice. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold my chisel like this. One hand behind it, one hand over the top of it. Rest it on the voice, and I'm just going to go in and I'm going to use my body weight to flatten this out. Okay? Now this is soft wood, so it's not going to be too difficult. Alright. And you can see there, I'm still only focusing on the front, kind of two or three quarters of it, maybe. I'm not going near the back of it, so I don't splinter it out. So let's just focus on getting the front of the flat. And it might not look like it, but this chisel is in, in control. You gotta be in control here, okay? So just remember, and I've, I'll say this to my students in, you know, in class and stuff like that, if I'm working at this speed, and this is your first time doing this, you shouldn't be walking at the same speed as me. You should be walking at a fraction of the speed I'm working with. You know, maybe half the speed. All right, so that's paired like so. Flip it around. 
and go from the other side and do the same thing. Now, I'm not fully down to the marking gauge line, so I'm gonna go back in, line it up again, and do that and pair it a little bit smaller. Probably gonna do that off camera just to speed up this video. Okay, so here we are a few minutes later. I've got that paired flat. Happy with that now, down to the marking gauge line on both sides, and it's perfectly flat across. And I've cleaned up the insides here just to make sure there's no waste that's gonna make the housing joint uh, not fit together. Uh, ignore my little scribbles there, that was just me roughly uh, sketching stuff out. What we're going to do is we're going to measure over from this line and we're going to mark a center point here for where we're going to drill for a tea light candle holder. Okay, it's the first thing we're going to do. So I'm going to measure over 35 millimeters. So 35 from this over to the Troy square and let's just draw a line like so. All right. Then what we're going to do is we're going to measure from front to back. We're going to measure another 35. That's going to give me the center point of this space in here. And we're going to drill with our fastener bit. We're going to drill a little slot for a tea light candle holder. So let's just take our ruler like that. I use my finger to keep it flat against the edge. Let's measure in 35 from the front. And then just mark a point. So 35 over, 35 in, mark a point. And then I'm going to show you in a few minutes how to drill that out on the pillar drill. But first, let's take this line here. This one here that I'm drawing the arrow to. And let's cut that clean off create two pieces and we'll have a look at how our housing joint turned out okay so i've got my piece here and push up in against my voice gonna make sure i've got my line lined up on my notch again this is this line here all right the forward line to your right hand side okay take my tenon saw same stance as we had before nice and balanced with our index finger on the outside of it i'm gonna use my finger again to give it a guide once twice three times and this time we're just going all the way through the material so let's try and make sure this cuts as straight as we can get it's important for my students that as they're cutting they stop and they check their piece to make sure that they're cutting on the line okay and there we go that's cut clean off Happy with that now, okay. We've got our piece like this. I'm just gonna get the bench hook out of the way for you. It's clean like that. Now, what we could do is we could check our, our cut to see if that fit as the housing joint. But let's be a bit smart here. Let's use the straight edge that was cut on the table saw. And let's lift that and let's put that into our trench like so. And that's our housing joint like so. Okay. Not the best housing joint I've ever made, certainly not the worst, but it's perfect for this demonstration and video. Our aim is to try and reduce any sort of gaps that are going on between it like that, but I kind of expected that to happen because I was recording this on camera. All right, so there's our housing joint like so. The pieces just slot in together. And what we will do is we will take some glue and we will clamp that in place, but we'll do that after we finish everything up. Um, and I'll probably won't bother doing that on the video because, um, there's no real need for it. It's just a bit of glue, clamp it in, and I'll probably do an assembly video separate. But for this project, let's jump to the pillar drill now and let's drill this little holder out for the, the tea light candle. Okay, so we're over here at the pillar drill. Now, I'm not gonna do a full tutorial on the pillar drill and how to set it up and stuff like that because I'll do that as a separate video. What my students need to know, okay, is it'll be set up in terms of the voice and the clamp when they come over. All right, they don't need to touch any power just yet. Don't touch anything just yet. The only thing you need to do is put your piece into the voice like this and then tighten it up. And you want to line up the center point with the center point of the fastener bit. Okay, and you need to use this lever to check that out, all right? Now, I'm very close there. I'm just going to tighten this up a little bit more and I'm happy with that, okay? So, I've got my piece. It's clamped in. It's tight to the table. I've got this clamp here, just making sure this is secure. Yep, the table's all secure, happy with that. They don't need to touch anything else because I've got the guide set up and stuff like that. But what they do need to know is this. 
the on off switch is here and if you need you can hit the front of this this red button here will stop it and turn the machine off lastly then there's an isolator switch in the wall behind it should in an emergency you need to turn the, the, the machine off however you can it's very difficult to torture yourself with this machine especially if you follow my instructions no loose jewelry or clothes okay long hair tie it up tie it back all right your hands don't need to be anywhere near this, near this cutter when it's turning on. You turn the power on and you hold the lever up here. So you shouldn't hurt yourself. The only way you're going to hurt yourself is when you hit the stop button, if you go for your material while the cutter is still spinning. So after you press stop and you're done with the machine, step back, just let the machine completely stop itself. Should happen within 10 seconds and then go in for your material. All right. So let's just bring this uh, cutter into this and cut down a little bit. Uh, we don't need to go all the way through, but just a little bit to give some sort of a, a space for the tea light candle holder to sit into. Alright, so there we go. Here's the machine running. Let's just grab our lever and let's go down into the material. You don't need to go and try to take loads of material at one time. It's important to let the, the uh, waste clear by letting the cutter come back out. Okay, there we go. That's more than enough now. And let's just turn our machine off. And it stopped nearly instantly, less than 10 seconds, definitely. Take our piece out, let's give it a tap on the voice just to get rid of it. And there we go, I'd be happy with that now for my tea light candle holder. We'll bring you back over to the workbench now, and let's just have a chat about how this project turned out. Right, so we're back over to the workbench. Project's finished. One little correction I want to make on the pillar drill demonstration you just watched is I never highlighted that I had goggles on me, and I still have them on me there. Um, in about five or six of the other recordings, they didn't make the final cut, I highlighted it, and then the last one that I actually chose to use is the one time I never mentioned that I had goggles on me. You probably saw them in the video, but um, I would be very reluctant to ever use a pillar drill without goggles on personally, and I would never allow my students to, to use a pillar drill without a set of goggles on, it would make that compulsory. Recommend it for any woodworker watching this video. Just with that quarter spinning, bits can come back at you, and it's just an unnecessary risk not to wear goggles in that situation. So with that out of the way, let's have a look at this project. Let's have a little bit of an evaluation of it, okay? I'm not gonna glue it up, because there's no need for me to do that in this video, but my students in class would be putting a little bit of glue there, clamping this down, and making sure that this piece is vertical, okay? Apart from that, the housing joint turned out okay. As I said, not the best, not the worst housing joint I've ever made. And it definitely needs a little bit of sanding, take off the pencil marks and stuff like that, tidy it up. One of the things I will say is, um, just it's very blocky on the top so i would encourage my students to maybe put some chamfer on the top or to round it over and put a bit of a curve on it or something like that i definitely wouldn't be leaving that like that if it was my project and um, but like that it depends on how you know fast you get through the project and stuff like that uh, for the purpose of this demonstration it's absolutely perfect it does the job and shows you the key skills that you need so that's that that's the first project build um, I'm going to be putting up a video on a halving joint next, which will be kind of, these two projects will feed into the tour project then, where we'll be using both halving and housing joints. Um, hopefully the, the video has continuity. It was recorded over a handful of days with lots and lots of errors, mistakes, and interruptions, which I've learned is something that you don't see behind the camera on most YouTube videos. So uh, it's, uh, it's been an interesting experience, my first recording of, of this for YouTube. Um, hopefully you've subscribed. If you haven't, please do subscribe to the channel. And as I said, on top of just the project builds that are from my students, I'll be doing some of my own work. I'm going over now to jump on the lathe and do some ball turning. So I probably reckon I'll, I'll record some of that and add that into the, in the, one of the next videos to come along. So yeah, um, that's really that. So uh, hopefully I'll see you next next video. If not, Thank you for sticking around.